Thank you, thank you very much for the opportunity to, um, to present our work. My name is Alberto Fernandez. I am the head of uh, the Digitalization and Democracy Program at International IDEA. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with International IDEA, we are an intergovernmental organization. We have 35 member states, ranging from South Africa, Indonesia, Sweden, Peru, Germany, um, uh, Mongolia, so very diverse uh, membership uh, with the sole mandate to support democracy worldwide. So I'm going to present you um, our work on, on artificial intelligence and elections. And as a, as a starter, I want to, to, to make clear that artificial, the, the role of artificial intelligence during elections goes well beyond just generative AI. It's way bigger than that. And, and I, I, I want you to kind of like understand the presentation with that, with that in mind. Uh, generative AI is just one part of artificial intelligence. So let me start with this. Why are we talking about artificial intelligence? There are two key things that we need to keep into account because these two things actually influence elections. The first one is the advances in deep learning, including the transformist architecture, the things that connect the, the dots. Um, that type of connections that in our mind are completely natural for a computer or not. And transformance architecture uh, makes that possible. And that has also been, uh, has implied like a massive expansion of the capacity of uh, artificial intelligence and deep learning. But parallel to that, and this is more important probably for elections, is the avail availability of data and computing power. I remember um, when, when we were, when I was studying university that I have a professor that was explaining us a complex social phenomenon. And he was telling us, well, if one day we have all the data about every time these car cars goes through this street and we actually have the computing power, then we will know why there is always a traffic jam here. But we don't have that, he said, back in the days. Today we do, we do have that availability of data and we have the computing power. These two things is what are getting, um, th th that are the reason why we're here today speaking about artificial intelligence in democracy. What are the implications? What does it mean, these two things? The first one is less interpretability. We don't really know what happens between the input and the output, between the moment we ask an artificial intelligence system to do something and the result of that question. It's much more difficult to understand, to interpret why a particular output. But we also have more capacity to train models um, because we have much more data. Keep in mind, imagine just the data that all the uh, people living in Nairobi produce every time they look on Google Maps where something is, where something is, like where is this, this, this place, this street, this shop. That creates a massive amount of data that it can be used to train models. This implies a great opportunity to make elections better, faster, and more secure. But it also brings a lot of challenges and concerns. Um, there is a lot of um, challenges that everybody involved in an election will, will face uh, that we need to take into account. So let's start here. Let's start with the risk and challenges. What risk are we facing when it comes to, inter to artificial intelligence and elections? The first one is performance, accuracy, and sustainability for the task, suit suitability for the task. Whereas for a private company, having a 0 0.1 mistake in, let's say, counting the amount of dishwashers that a factory has produced, it's not a problem. It's, it's okay. For an election, that's not acceptable. You need accuracy to the highest level. And right now, we're not there yet. And you need the performance to secure that accuracy. So that's a challenge. You can't take the error that artificial intelligence still implies when it comes to accuracy. Uh, so for elections and for democracy, the 0.1% 0, 0 error is too much. It brings human rights questions, it brings bias, and it, and it brings discrimination because of the way data has been gathered, because of the nature and the structure of the data. Artificial intelligence might bring a lot of bias and discriminations. It's not the system itself. It's not that the artificial intelligence system is discriminating or has bias. It's because it's reflecting society. It's reflecting the reality of society. The data reflects the reality of society. Therefore, it reflects its bias and its discrimination. 
That doesn't mean we have to reproduce them. We need to address them. The third issue is public trust and transparency. Again, with the same with accuracy, we cannot allow people to lose trust in the elections because we just want to implement a fancy artificial intelligence tool. Public trust is the currency of elections and democracy. It is more important than a fancy artificial intelligence uh, tool. So the big, a big challenge is to maintain public trust and transparency. And then the last one is cybersecurity. This is usually we ignore it, uh, we don't think about it, but the fact that um, any application of artificial intelligence during an election, and, and this includes political campaigns, implies um, reliance on, on, on technology, reliance on data, and that increases their threats to our digital infrastructure. Uh, so we become more vulnerable uh, to cyber attacks. Um, we become more vulnerable to malign actors who wanted to disrupt uh, the elections or the campaign. So there is a really big cybersecurity uh, challenge here. How do these challenges boil down to threats, to concrete threats? So I would like to take the three main threats that I think are cybersecurity, um, sorry, artificial intelligence brings. The first one is the one you're all thinking about, misinformation. It has never been a problem of supply. Uh, misinformation has all misinformation, disinformation, the pollution of the information environment has always been there. But artificial intelligence bring, uh, brings a higher capacity to generate uh, this information, an increase in quality and in quantity, um, and also unintentional misinformation. Imagine an electoral authority who has a miss uh, a chat box, a chat chatbot that gives uh, wrong information. That would be unintentional, but it's still very damaging to um, to the elections. A second aspect I already spoke about it is cybersecurity higher quality of phishing attempts, uh, phishing, uh, attempts uh, potentially more um, capable malware and other um, cyber attacks, also an increase in the uh, threat surface that elections will face. And then the third um, key challenge, key threat that artificial intelligence poses is to campaigns. Um, campaigns, political campaigns can use artificial intelligence for a lot of things, but that creates a lot of threats in terms of the way they do data analysis, the advertisement, uh, the data collection and privacy, uh, the use of chatbots, it brings a lot of different threats to the elections. But they can, artificial intelligence can also make elections better uh, and it can be used to run freer and fairer elections and to make elections more inclusive. Let me just walk through some of the ideas on how that could uh, happen. In the pre-electoral phase, think, uh, we can think of things like voter list management, clean the list, um, uh, facilitate voter registration, um, help electoral management bodies on resource, al resource allocation, baseline estimation settings, forecasting the cost, improving civic education and mobilization, improving the, the information that the electoral management body is giving to the people, improving the capacity of campaigns to bring correct information. During the elections, for instance, we can implement social media misinformation monitoring. I'm not so much fan of using AIR for social media monitoring, but still, uh, it can help a lot. We can implement voter identification and verification technologies, uh, counting and tabulation, real-time turnout analysis to help um, security forces, for instance, know where there is more people, that type of things. And in the post-election period, we can have post-electoral audits, um, which will help to, to, to uh, make sure that the results are valid. Uh, imagine a country where the electoral authority is saying one thing and um, civil society is saying another thing, and then government is saying a third thing about what the results have been. If you have implemented an, an artificial intelligence system that runs post-electoral audits, that type of discrepancies can be addressed. Let's go to how do we regulate this? I know your lawyers, you like to regulate things. Let's go to how to regulate this. And, and these are some of the best practices that are applicable to any country in the world. There is no particularities in, in these best practices. And one of the important things when speaking about artificial intelligence is that even though some countries are more advanced than others when it comes to developing the technology, all countries have started at the same place when it comes to regulating it. So it has leveled the playing field and all countries are starting almost from the same position when it comes to regulating. The first thing, 
and this works for anything that has to be with um, that involves data is let's adhere to the principles of necessity, data minimization, and proportionality. You don't need to collect more data than the necessary. You should collect only the data that you use, and you should uh, do a proportional uh, use of uh, co data collection. Without data, there is no artificial intelligence. So this is super important. Second one, when regulating, focus, consult uh, marginalized communities and try to address the negative externalities that this might create. Artificial intelligence might be, uh, might be a great tool to actually uh, address marginalized uh, communities, uh, to, address, to, to reach to them, but you need to focus on them. Always, always, always implement human oversight and run comparisons uh, and in, involve always a human in the loop, but especially at the end of it. Never let a machine take a decision. Always let a human take the final decision. Even if we make a lot of mistakes, we're still humans. Uh, machines will never be humans. Run thorough security performance and edit audits and make it legal, make it make it compulsory by law that those things are run. No, they're not an add-on. They're something that needs to be done and authorities should be obliged to do this. Work with local officials and community groups to identify misinformation. This is especially important for electoral management bodies and everybody working on the elections. Local officials and local communities are going to have the best knowledge of this. Do not share away of proactively engaging with tech companies and social media platforms. They have a lot of expertise. They have a lot of people working on this. They have no intention to generate disasters in elections. They actually like elections to run smoothly and never be accused of having alter an election. So engage with them. Hold campaigns accountable. This is extremely important in general for democracy, but also for artificial intelligence. If a campaign is using uh, artificial intelligence in a way that is not the correct one, hold them accountable. And strengthen existing cybersecurity practices. I know I have talked about this quite a lot, but I can't insist enough on how important is cybersecurity. Last, I want to bring some key challenges and, and questions for Africa. As I say, most things apply to all countries equally, but there are particular things that are um, very important to keep in mind for uh, the continent. The first one is to create Africans' own legislative agency. Any rule, any policy, any legislation that is done on artificial intelligence should be done by Africans, by Africa, for Africa, and with African values. And this applies to other continents. It's, it's nothing special of of the region. It should be the same in Europe, it should be the same in Latin America, it should be the same in Asia. But it needs to happen. It needs to have um, legislative agency and it should be done by Africa, for Africa, with African values. It seems easy, it's not. A second concern, the second challenge, or the, 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 probably the most important challenge, is how to build Africa's artificial intelligence skills. And again, this is not a particular for Africa. It is the same issue in Latin America. It is the same discussion in Europe. It is the same discussion in Africa. Every continent, every region needs to have this discussion. How to build the capacity throughout the continent uh, for artificial intelligence, to develop it, to implement it, to monitor it, to keep um, improving them. Each region needs to develop their own capacity. And that starts probably in universities, investing money in uh, IT departments, in legal departments that are looking into these issues. Um, it implies building the capacity in the state, bringing the most capable people within the state administrations. And I know what I'm saying is very difficult to do everywhere in the world, but it needs to be done. And the third one, contrary to this, is harness global advances, but retain ownership and agency. Artificial intelligence is a global technology. They can't be an African artificial intelligence or an Asian artificial intelligence. It's a global thing. So the continent needs to be ready to harness those global advances, but then take them and retain ownership and agency, being capable of building its own system, be capable of building its, its own applications of those global advances. Um, these are massive challenges. These are actually challenges that happen um, in many other regions, 
but they 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 have particular um, components in in the African region, and this applies not only to elections, it's, uh, to democracy, it applies to everything. So with that, I want to thank you, Asante Sana, for the time, uh, and I'm looking forward to the conversation and the questions.